So, uh, yeah, good afternoon. My name's Richard Ekman. Um, I am at uh, both NASA Langley Research Center and NASA headquarters where I manage a uh, atmospheric composition program. And I'll be talking to you this afternoon about a, a slightly different topic, uh, uh, the uh, stratospheric ozone layer and why we care about it, what's been happening with it, uh, a international treaty that was signed 30 years ago that uh, has been uh, remarkably effective and what NASA is doing to observe uh, the ozone layer. So for, for those of you here, you, you probably are at least vaguely aware of the importance of ozone in the atmosphere. The, the, the stratospheric ozone layer protects us from the sun's ultraviolet radiation and, and really is, is part of the reason why life uh, not just humans, but plants and everything else can exist at the surface because this uh, harmful UV radiation uh, is largely shielded by the ozone layer. So uh, here we have a plot, a time history from 1960 going on to the present and onwards into the future with, with uh, atmospheric models. So uh, up until the present, uh, these are uh, largely real observations. And uh, you can see what happened particularly in the uh, early 1980s. And I should say this is over the Antarctic Peninsula. So again, following on from, from our last talk, but now thinking about the area uh, about uh, 18 or 20 kilometers above the surface of the Earth uh, in the uh, lower stratosphere. And, and what uh, was found in the early 80s, uh, not by NASA satellites, but by intrepid uh, researchers from the British Antarctic Survey who were measuring ozone using ground-based spectrometers uh, and had been doing that since 1958, uh, they noticed a, a sharp decline in ozone through the early 1980s uh, in springtime, and, and the seasons are reversed uh, in the southern hemisphere. So this was after the long polar winter and the return of sunlight. And um, they didn't understand why the trend was going down quite precipitously. I mean, uh, we, we were seeing a trend uh, through the 60s and 70s, but then dramatically through the 80s. And um, so one of those researchers, Joe Farman, from, uh, uh, who was based in Cambridge University, but uh, spent a lot of time in the Antarctic at Halley Bay, wrote a paper in Nature in 1985, which led to, uh, really shocked the atmospheric uh, uh, um, composition community. Uh, chemists, dynamicists didn't really understand what was happening. And uh, it, it only took around two years for a consensus to emerge. And it, it, it really led to uh, our uh, confirmation of uh, stratospheric uh, depleting chemicals like the chlorofluorocarbons. If we could go to the next, do I have the control or? Uh, oh, yeah, if, oh, thanks. So um, uh, again, so I'll, I'll get to this in a moment. But, but it, it led to a quick consensus through a, 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 a lot of, uh, of coordinated effort, field campaigns conducted by NASA and our international partners, uh, as well as satellite observations that, that really found a, a smoking gun, so to speak, that, that confirmed that unusual processes in the Antarctic, uh, a lower stratosphere, uh, that... Um, were largely due to man-made impacts, uh, uh, particularly the core fluorocarbons, which uh, uh, are used in a, a whole host of industrial applications like uh, uh, air conditioning, uh, both in, in homes and industry. And, and these can uh, break up uh, under certain circumstances and create uh, chlorine uh, molecules that uh, a chlorine monoxide that can destroy ozone very efficiently. So uh, this led to a very quick action by international governments that led to a treaty under UN auspices called the Montreal Protocol back in 1987, so uh, almost 30 years ago, which led to uh, the phasing out of some of these more uh, 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 unfriendly 
constituents that uh, were were used in industrial applications, and I I I'd, uh, I I'd suggest that th this was an incredibly um, uh, um, useful and and uh, and successful treaty in that all of the nations in the world, uh, all UN members have signed up to it, and it's largely been complied with. Uh, the uh, CFCs and other ozone-depleting chemicals have largely been substituted with more ozone-friendly constituents. So what we're left with is that uh, our understanding of the ozone layer suggests that as the CFCs are removed from the atmosphere, we would expect to see a reduction in the, in the annual ozone haul, the decline in ozone, and, and an eventual recovery over time. And so what you can see here is from 1985 on to uh, about 10 years ago, 2005, that uh, we were seeing still a reduction in ozone year on year, but it, it, it largely began to level out. And uh, let's go to the next slide. Um, and um, so, I'll get to this in a moment. Um, so what, what we would expect is a gradual turnaround and a recovery in ozone over time. And the Montreal Protocol mandated that nations monitor, continue to monitor the ozone. And in the United States, both NASA and NOAA were, uh, uh, Congress directed both NASA and NOAA to monitor uh, the ozone layer and our progress with uh, looking for recovery in ozone. So we, we have a whole host of satellites that NASA has launched over the years that monitor ozone and other uh, atmospheric constituents in, in the atmosphere. And uh, one of them is uh, the SAGE satellite. Uh, SAGE stands for the Stratospheric Aerosol and Gas Experiment. Uh, this, in fact, is a picture of the fourth iteration of SAGE, confusingly still called SAGE-3, uh, that was developed at NASA Langley in Hampton, Virginia, and launched earlier this year on February 19th at Kennedy by a SpaceX Falcon 9, the photograph here. And, um, and was launched successfully and then attached to the space station. We're, we're beginning to do a lot more Earth science from the space station. It, it's, um, it's quite a good and, and less expensive venue to attach Earth observing instruments to. And uh, so this SAGE satellite uh, instrument was uh, uh, developed with that in mind. And then we used the Canadian robotic arm uh, aboard the space station to attach this instrument to the station. So, next slide. Um, and um, so, I'll, I'll just show a few schematic diagrams to because I want to show a video of the actual installation, which I think you'll find very interesting. Uh, so, this is a picture or a, a computer a graphic of. Uh, the station. This shows where the SAGE instrument was mounted on the express logistics carrier number four. A little bit of a blow up of it. Uh, not a very high resolution diagram, but again showing the actual satellite instrument and then an L-shaped bracket called the Nader viewing platform. And so uh, next, um, and uh, so again, just again to orient uh, yourself. This is the actual SAGE instrument that you'll see in a moment. And uh, let's move on. Um, so this is the actual, uh, not in real time, but sped up considerably. Uh, it took place over the course of two days where the instrument was removed from the SpaceX Dragon uh, capsule, uh, the Falcon 9 uh, capsule. This is showing the robotic arm here going in and pulling uh, the um, SAGE instrument and that L-shaped bracket out and uh, not, um, and here we go. Here's this L-shaped bracket. You can see the word SAGE stenciled on. The Canadian Dexter robotic arm, it has two arms going a little fast, but here's that L-shaped bracket, here's the actual instrument, the earth obviously underneath, solar panels rotating into view. And uh, again, this took 
parts of two days to actually happen. A, a very carefully choreographed dance, so obviously we didn't want to damage anything. And uh, here we see this L-shaped bracket being attached to that uh, express logistics carrier. Um, and now you can actually see the instrument itself being mated to the uh, Nader viewing platform. Um, there it goes. The arm goes away. Uh, oh, here, I'm sorry. The, uh, that, that was the, here is the actual instrument now being mated to the L-shaped bracket. A, a little bit of uncertainty there, a little shakiness, but they did align the mounting pins here and on the other side. And uh, this took many minutes to actually take place. And uh, there we go, the robotic arm moved away and the instrument assembly. Uh, and uh, that's it. I think we've moved back to the beginning again. But um, so I don't think we really have time to run through that again. But um, yeah, so the, the SAGE was launched just in February. Initial results have just been publicly released and are archived at the NASA Atmospheric Science Data Center at Langley, freely available, of course. And uh, I fully expect at next year's AGU that my colleagues will have numerous science talks on these initial results. Just some teasers to show you some of the capabilities of the SAGE instrument. Here is a vertical profile. This is ozone number density versus altitude from the surface up to 100 kilometers. So this is the um, uh, mid to upper troposphere, stratosphere, going into the mesosphere and showing the very high vertical resolution of the SAGE instrument, showing the peak in ozone in the lower stratosphere, then a secondary peak way up in the uh, uh, upper mesosphere, 90 kilometers above the surface. Uh, and uh, a few comparisons with, um, uh, with uh, so the uh, green or bluish AER uh, ozone is the actual measurements uh, with uncertainty bars, and Klim ozone is a, um, uh, a, a model result um, and uh, showing very, very good agreement uh, between ozone and uh, at, at various latitudes. So just a few teasers, we're, we're going to see, I'm, I'm sure, some, some very uh, interesting results uh, uh, next year and uh, at other science conferences coming up over the course of 2018. Uh, next. And uh, we, is that, that's it. Okay. So, yeah, so we're, we're, we're excited by this that it's not just ozone, uh, it's other trace constituents, the aerosols in the atmosphere that SAGE will measure, nitrogen dioxide, water vapor, and we're in a situation in time where SAGE can really contribute to looking for the emergence of this full, uh, expected ozone recovery uh, that uh, all of the models predict, that some other satellites are beginning to see hints of, and, uh, and um, it, it's, it's a very exciting time. And, uh, uh, I, I hope that I've also convinced you that these, um, that this international treaty, the Montreal Protocol, uh, is is a example of a not exactly climate treaty, but but a uh, a, 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 a treaty that uh, led to a dramatic improvement in uh, a uh, atmospheric constituent that was vital for our health of the planet. So um, thanks very much for your attention, 